We're going to start with a few access notes. And I think I'm just going to hope for an indication from one of my colleagues to make sure that this is the right time to start. Yep, you can start. Thank you. Um, so tonight's events um, last about two hours, and that will include a question and answer period at the end. Uh, tonight's events are being recorded. So that means that all your comments that you share in the chat or that are voiced will also be recorded. If you require captioning for tonight's events, uh, there is a CC icon, icon or a closed captioning icon in the Zoom menu. All you need to do is activate that icon in order to see the captions. We have ASL interpreters tonight, BL and Mel. And uh, if you're having trouble seeing them, please turn your screen view to gallery view. You can find that in the top right hand corner. Um, before we turn to the questions and answers, one of my colleagues will probably later on in the evening will probably tell you how to uh, na navigate that part of the Zoom room. So thank you for joining us tonight for Disability Art on Lockdown. I'm um, before uh, we start, I'm going to offer a land acknowledgement. So Toronto and Ryerson University are in the Dish With One Spoon territory. Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississauga, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the, to share the territory and to protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And that's Ryerson's official land acknowledgement. And we start with this formal land acknowledgement as a way to acknowledge um, Indigenous presence and sovereignty of the land and a way as an endeavor towards a larger effort towards reconciliation and learning together. This is a, an effort that we try to practically enact within the School of Disability Studies by working in solidarity with indigenous movements, such as the movement to um, call out and stop police brutality, to stop um, discrimination against Indigenous people in uh, the inquiries and the investigations and crimes against, against Indigenous people, as we're seeing in the news right now around the death of Colton Boucher. We're committed to, to working together um, and learning from our elders from elders and knowledge keepers, both in the larger community and within our classrooms. So my name is Esther Nani, and I am the associate I am the associate professor and the director of the School of Disabilities Studies at Ryerson University. And on behalf of my colleagues, Dr. Idil Abdullahi. Dr. Eliza Chandler, Dr. Catherine Church, our postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Adin Sherapool, and Ricky, who I will introduce later, and our very talented pool of contract lecturers. I want to welcome you to tonight's event. If you're one of our many students who are here tonight from one of our courses, we really look forward to being together soon in person, but we're so pleased that you can join us together. And we hope that in the Q&A that we can actually start talking to one another. If you're new to the school or you're an old friend, we really encourage you to check out our social media and our website to see upcoming events, new courses, and 
activist initiatives, new research that's underway at the school. I'm sure you'll find that there are resonances with Dr. McCurr's work who we'll be hearing later this evening. We have a commitment to unsettle taken for granted ways of understanding disability and to embrace the ways that crip, mad and deaf ways of knowing and being in the world can help us see and make the, other, the world otherwise. Now tonight's events have been organized by Dr. Ricky Varghese. Ricky is the inaugural Tannis Doe postdoctoral fellow in disability, gender, and social justice. Um, Ricky's been with us since May, uh, May 2020. And in that 10 months, he's been with us virtually. We've not been in the same room together. And yet he's made a tremendous contribution to the school. For those of you who don't know Ricky, he received his PhD in social justice education at Boise University of Toronto. Um, he's a social worker and a practicing psychotherapist and he's training to be a psychoanal psychoanalyst. Um, Ricky's work is interdisciplinary in nature. It blends cultural theory, queer theory, and disability studies together with social justice. His writing is tremendously elegant. And if you haven't, I, I ask you to read his edited collection raw for a sample of his really powerful analysis around um, men's sexuality. Part of Ricky's work at the school at the school during his postdoc will be to write a book exploring masculinity suicide and the death instinct um, I, my final words around ricky is that he is a consummate events organizer and um, we can look forward to another speaker series, a shirk funded speaker series starting in May, Sex and the Pandemic. And maybe Ricky will tell us a little bit about that. Um, but for now, I turn the event over to him. Hi, everyone. Um, and and that's the, for that uh, generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to see so many people have signed in for our event tonight. Um, so I had the idea of bringing Robert in because my, one of my classes, uh, a class that I'm teaching this semester, they're actually reading his book that he had. Um, sex and disability, I highly recommend it. My students love it. And so I thought, you know, why not bring Robert in and, and have him, you know, in a, in a lecture at Ryerson and, and see what he's working on right now. Uh, so that's sort of the emphasis behind this. Um, as as I mentioned, I'm also organizing another speaker series uh, called Sex and Pandemic. That's coming up in a few months, and more information about that will come out um, in time. And I'll actually provide everyone with the website for an event in the chat shortly. So. I want to start by introducing Robert, um, who is someone I have actually known for a very, very long time, um, quite, quite almost 50 years. So it's amazing to have him here with us virtually. Um, and Robert McClure's work as writer and speaker is situated at the intersection of queer theory, disability studies, and transnational cultural studies. He is professor of English at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. 
that it, it's a, a range of classes. It, 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 it actually is a disability studies, land national, clear film studies, and clear of power, clip of power, clipping. Clip Lines, Disability, Organization, and Resistance, a book that was published by NYU in 2018, is his most recent publication. Clip Lines focuses on disability art and activism in the UK and elsewhere, examining the ways in which disability is an underutilized component of the global austerity politics. The Clue is also the author of the field shifting to award winning volume Clip Theory, Helpful Signs of Clearness and Disability, also published by FYU in 2006, as well as numerous other books and articles. A Spanish edition of Clip Theory will be out on June 1st of this year. The Anna Marlowe, he is co-editor of Sex and Disability, the book that I just mentioned. And the Edith Bolt, the general co-editor of the six volume series, a cultural history of disability uh, published by Bloomsbury last year, which includes volumes from antiquity in the modern age. So how it easily is going to see is that uh, Robert is going to do his lecture, and after that, they're going to have some respondents, um, respondent is his paper, and then at the very end, they're going to have about half an hour to have questions and answers and discussions with the audience. So Robert, uh, Thank you so much, Ricky. I'm going to share my screen and then say hello to you all. Okay, share screen. Um, okay. I don't think that it's showing, is it? There we go, I think. Good. All right, thank you so much, Ricky and everyone. Uh, one more thing, I am going to turn off my own closed captions. Oops. Okay, thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Esther. Uh, thank you, Tally, and everyone who has worked to make this an incredibly um, accessible event here at Ryerson. I'm really happy to be back at Ryerson. I gave a talk in your unexpected lecture series. So I was giving a talk, I think, at York, and Ryerson had me come in 2009. So it's been a long time since I have been at Ryerson. I'm happy to be with you all virtually. It's roughly 13, year, uh, 13 months since I've been in Canada, which I miss a lot. I grew up outside of Detroit and try to see friends in Windsor when I am there, but of course that border has been closed. So I hope we'll all be able to be in person at some time soon. I wanna give a brief description of myself for, for access. I am a white man in my mid fifties. I have short salt and pepper hair and a lockdown beard. I'm wearing a light blue short sleeve shirt. I'm in a moderately lit room with books and a purple wall in the background. Uh, I use he, him, his pronouns. And I am not in Toronto, as I just mentioned. I am in Washington, DC, which is the ancestral land of the Piscataway and Anacostan peoples, uh, unceded ancestral land that we are on here in Washington, DC. So, I am going to begin and I have, I think, about 40 minutes of material to show you. Tali is offering to meet any access needs that you have if you uh, write to Tally in the chat. That might include also my PowerPoint. If you need it emailed to you for alt text reasons, 
the pictures that I will be showing, I will try to describe, but if it's easier for anyone to actually have a copy of the PowerPoint, there are alt text descriptions of all of the images and I think that someone can send that to you if it is an access need. So without further ado, I'm going to dive into disability art on lockdown, uh, which is my title slide that is shown here. The image that is on the title slide I'm going to be talking about a little bit later in the lecture. On May 12th, 2020, The Guardian reported on the authoritarian populist president of Brazil's disdain for artists who had died of COVID-19. The screen here shows some of those images of COVID-19 deaths, five elderly white men and one uh, African-American woman, or African-Brazilian woman. Jair Bolsonaro, a former military officer who has defended dictatorship and torture, has been dubbed the Trump of the tropics and has become infamous for his extreme views and bigotry. A few of the pre-COVID highlights include his frequent assertions that he is proudly homophobic and that he would prefer for his son to die in a car accident than be gay. He told an elected official that he would not rape her because she was, quote, not worthy of it. And he actively voted in the Chamber of Deputies for former President Dilma Rousseff's impeachment in the name of those who tortured her. During the years of military dictatorship in Brazil, he also actively celebrates every year the 1964 coup that brought the dictatorship to power. His first acts in office in January 2019 were to pull back land rights for indigenous groups and for descendants of slaves in Brazil in order to reopen the Amazon in particular for development and an additional early act when he came into office to remove LGBT people from protections that would be afforded them by the Ministry of Human Rights. Violence against LGBT people LGBT people and others in Brazil was already incredibly high, but rose dramatically during Bolsonaro's first year in office. At the end of the year before COVID-19, Sao Paulo alone was in fact registering, registering 16 hate crimes against minority groups a day. During the pandemic, Bolsonaro, who dismissed COVID-19 famously as a little flu, contracted the virus and appeared to recover from it. Although almost 300,000 people in Brazil have died, um, that's uh, as of yesterday. Um, the tragedy in Brazil is second only to the tragedy in the United States, and it actually seems possible that Brazil will pass the US eventually in cases and deaths, especially considering that many poor and indigenous deaths have gone uncounted. When I say that Bolsonaro appeared to recover, it's actually probably too soft. One could say that both with his illness and former injuries that he sustained after he was stabbed during the general election, he has actively constructed an overcoming narrative that, as overcoming narratives are, are wont to do, made others look weak in comparison. It's thus not surprising that Bolsonaro did nothing to recognize the Brazilian artist who died due to complications from COVID-19, including on the screen for you, well-known musicians, actors, and writers. One of the writers who died early in the pandemic was Ruben Fonseca. Fonseca's daughter, Bia Correa do Lago, also a writer, said Bolsonaro's indifference to the death of artists was not surprising, given that when he was asked about his favorite authors, Bolsonaro cited only a dictatorship error torturer, Carlos Alberto Brillante Ustro. I would argue that it's important to situate Bolsonaro's disdain for the death of artists due to COVID as only the logical conclusion of increasingly institutionalized disdain for living artists who are already reeling from an anti-arts, anti-education, anti-humanities climate, even before Bolsonaro took office in January 2019. I would in fact argue that Bolsonaro's embrace of torture as an alternative to art makes explicit something that was hitherto simply implicit, perhaps even beyond the borders of Brazil. 
Although Bolsonaro's predecessor, Michel Temer, following protests, restored the Ministry of Culture that he had cut upon assuming office, Bolsonaro in 2019 simply cut the Ministry of Culture again. And despite pre-COVID protests by artists and students, accelerated cuts to education and the arts. Austerity measures like these, particularly entrenched in Brazil, but operative globally, are in the background of anything that I have to say today. It hardly requires saying, of course, although I will, that living artists and not just in Brazil have not fared well on lockdown through the COVID-19 crisis. The New York Times reports that although arts venues were often among the first to close during the crisis, they are or will likely be in most locations the last to reopen. In the United States, during the quarter ending in September of 2020, when the overall unemployment rate averaged about 8.5%, 52% of actors, 55% of dancers, and 27% of musicians were out of work, according to the National Endowment for the Arts. By comparison, the jobless rate for waiters was 27%, 19% for cooks, and about 13% for retail salespeople over the same time period. And of course, these figures reveal nothing about how the crisis has been even more pronounced for disabled actors, dancers, musicians, and other artists. Ricky Varghese has written recently about the pandemic that, quote, clarity in all senses of the word evades us in this moment, be it with respect to what the future may look like for us globally and locally, or even in regard to our ever evolving knowledge about this new virus, unquote. We, or I'm, I'm presuming a, a we that is gathered here today, the bulk of the we gathered here today, do know, however, that disabled people have not fared well in many ways during this crisis. Swedish queer crip artist Christine Byland, a drawing of whom is on your screen now, writes about government strategies during the crisis to center and, quote, protect disabled people. Strategies that have led to the experience of being put aside, she writes, and sacrificed for the convenience of the able bodied majority. On one side, Byland is being sharply critical of a paternalistic do no harm attitude that's particularly patronizing to disabled people in Sweden. That is, uh, the attitude is sort of don't think about what disabled freedom might look like because somebody could get hurt uh, and hence disabled people need to be protected through the crisis. From another angle, however, Beeland is simply teasing out something that has arguably been shared across borders during lockdown. And her own work as artist is often about sharing queer and crip ideas across borders uh, and across time, including uh, figures such as Frida Kahlo and Keith Haring. As I use Beeland here to pivot to bring more disabled artists on lockdown in, let me say as a caveat uh, that there's certainly no way I can live up to the promise of my title disability art on lockdown. First, because it's too soon to know all of the amazing ways in which disability art through this pandemic is being generated. My conclusion, in fact, uh, depending on our time, will eventually quickly gesture towards a small selection of amazing art for you. And in the spirit of disability justice, we'll attempt to do that across borders. And I, I hope that the contributions of Jack and Sean will also help us to extend that idea of what disability art might look like. On the screen, I'm using an event by Dance New York City as a way of moving into my thicker project today. On June 16th, 2020, Dance New York City, as part of their Artists Are Necessary Workers series, hosted the virtual event, Disability Justice as the Vanguard of Recovery Thinking. And the participants that are on your screen, I will briefly note here, they included clockwise from upper left, uh, Christopher Unpez Verde Nunez, who identifies as a visually impaired dancer, queer and Costa Rican immigrant, immigrant to New York City, who was formerly undocumented. And actually a lot of what I'll say in what follows is going to be taking up directly the work of Nunez. 
Dustin Gibson, uh, an African-American um, Pittsburgh and St. Louis based artist uh, at working at the intersections of disability, race, class, and abolitionism. Alice Shepard, who is arguably uh, an Afro-British dancer, wheelchair user, who is arguably one of the most important dancers in my mind working today. You can find Alice on Instagram as wheelchair dancer. Uh, and Simi Linton uh, on the bottom row, who is the author of My Body Politic and producer of the disability documentary, Invitation to Dance. The fifth image on the screen is the ASL interpreter, uh, Brandon, for the event. The session in, in surveyed many issues, but made clear that disabled artists were in fact generating community, ideas, and work during the pandemic. Over the course of the session, there was a lot of debate about how disability art might be a vanguard of sorts, although there was debate about that word vanguard and also debate about the word recovery, as opposed to in true crypt tradition of generating multiple options, as opposed to words like rejuvenation, reinvention, and multiple other possibilities. So I'm thinking about work like this with my title, Disability Art on Lockdown, even as the title also arguably has a double valence. Um, as my introduction suggests with Brazil, as it gestures to the ways in which disability and art have increasingly been on lockdown globally, facing uh, massive cuts from many different governments and a sedimented logic of, of austerity everywhere, even before the crisis that we are living through. My points for this presentation will be fairly straightforward and at times even simple, uh, although I will also implicitly at least sort of make a case for simplicity, for that simplicity as I go. I will suggest in what follows that disability art on lockdown augments or should augment several crip queer modalities. And I'm gonna list five. One, a crip queer sense of process over product. And that was honestly the only way I could write a talk like this at this moment, hanging on to that idea of process over product. Two, crip collectivity that is grounded in disability justice as it has been developed largely by queers and crips of color. And I'll of course say more about that in what follows. Three, what has come to be called following Mary Lisa, Lisa Johnson's coinage of the term, crepistemologies, disabled ways of knowing. Four, what Emma Shepard has recently turned crip pacing, even though that concept is arguably a concept that has been collectively generated. And five, what various scholars, activists, and artists have imagined as crip world making. Um, I think Esther was actually gesturing towards Ryerson's work of crip world making in the introduction. That has gone by many names in the disability community and in disability studies, including what disability theorist Amy Hamrai terms alter livability. So to briefly gloss what I'm saying about uh, the only way I could write a talk like this at this moment, I think it's really important for us to keep noting how difficult work is at this moment to resist celebrations of a pending normalcy that would simply return us to the quotidian violences of capitalism and to make, and I, I think it's important for us to make these points as disability or crip insights. So just this week, the Toronto Star has published data suggesting that 38% of, of Canadians report that their mental health has worsened since lockdown, with that number jumping to 45% for LGBT people and 43% for low-income households. A full half of Canadians are experiencing ongoing anxiety and 23%, that actually seems low to me, depression. So uh, I just wanna keep that in mind as we think about what it means to work in this moment. To provide a bit more background for my talk, I'm gonna give you a mini snapshot of where my own crip queer work has been of late. My work on disability and art, both in my most recent book, which I'll put on the screen here, uh, and in one of the ones that is germinating now, has been pivoting towards disability justice in Latin America. 
So my recent book here pictured with the sculptures of artist Liz Crow. My recent book has read, as Ricky suggested, the last decade of global emergency is what I have termed crip times. My argument has been that in our moment, disability is a central but under theorized component of a global austerity politics. At this point, um, and really from fairly early in the pandemic, you'll see something almost every week in the press suggesting that austerity is done. I'm putting an example of such an article before you with Boris Johnson saying that he will not return to austerity. So you'll see this quite regularly in multiple locations. But I would argue that this crisis is showing us nothing if not how deeply entrenched austerity already was. With millions of people in the US over the past year losing healthcare because of the crisis, because healthcare is tied so often to employment, with disabled children and seniors doing online fundraisers for the National Health Service in the UK because of how the NHS has embraced business models and on and on. And I'll just give you an example of that. This uh, slide pictures Thomas More, who died in January at the age of 100 from complications due to COVID. And he raised 33 million pounds for the NHS for charity by walking in his garden. So I'm, I'm putting this forward as an example of how austerity is so deeply sedimented that you have seniors uh, doing fundraisers to save the NHS. There has been some sense that author authoritarian populists like Bolsonaro and former US President Donald Trump are or were more and more rejecting austerity. And that would seem to be represented by Trump's exit strategy of calling for a $2,000 stimulus uh, or Bolsonaro's in Portuguese ajuda help providing for a time checks for poor Brazilians. My own sense as someone writing about um, austerity for more than a decade is that it's generally a smokescreen, these statements that oh, austerity is going away for ongoing austerity. For neoliberalism continued in an authoritarian vein that throws a few crumbs to, the, to many while continuing to redistrib redistribute wealth upwards and in fact to militarize protection of that upward distribution of wealth. Crypt times, the phrase, um, however, like disability art on lockdown is also a multivalent phrase, absolutely pointing towards hard times, bleak times, precarity and suffering, but also towards vibrant cultural production and activist and artistic resistance that has emerged across borders out of or in excess of a logic of austerity and towards generative collective forms of disabled thought. So I'm gonna give you a quick reading of Nunez's pre-pandemic work, followed by his reinvention of that work over the past year. I'll survey his and others theorizing during the pandemic to illustrate crip process, collectivity, crip epistemologies, and crip pacing. Depending on how we're doing, on time, I'll end with gestures towards Beeland and a few other artists and collectives on lockdown to think really quickly, actually, about alter livability and crip world making. Nunez's process as an artist, and the, I will describe the performance that's on the screen right now momentarily. His process as an artist entailed literally crossing borders and arriving in New York and discovering disability community. I had actually seen some of his work in 2010 in Costa Rica, and I, I knew personally that he was visually impaired, but it was only in and through contact with the disability arts community that Nunez came out as disabled. An example, a beautiful example, really, perhaps of what I argued in Crip Theory, that it takes at least two people to make a Crip or a disabled person as a disabled, as a queer man, he had experienced violence in the past and saw his immigration to New York as a way of coming home to multiple facets of himself. Indeed, in an extensive video interview that I'll put before you here, made for Immigrant Heritage Week in New York City, he explains, this is home, New York, after a lawyer informed him that his request for asylum had been denied and that it might be time to think about going home, by which the lawyer meant Costa Rica. 
The incident for me recalls um, an ironic anecdote from queer disabled Chicana feminist Gloria Anzaldúa, who writes a meeting with lesbian students to discuss their fears. One of the students said, Anzaldúa recounts, I thought homophobia meant fear of going home. Anzaldúa continues deploying language, I think, that can be read easily through a disability lens. And I thought, how apt, fear of going home and of not being taken in. We're afraid of being abandoned by the mother, the culture, la raza, for being unacceptable, faulty, damaged. In many ways, like Nunez, Anzaldúa famously essentially creates home by turning um, a borderlands existence that is initially figured as broken, bleak, and defeated into something else or something more, another way of being in common with others and revaluing what she calls, quote, the squint-eyed, the perverse, the queer, the troublesome, the mongrel, the mulatto, the half-breed, the half-dead. In short, those who cross over, pass over, or go through the confines of the normal. For Nunez, even more than Ansel Dua, who never fully embraced the label disability, even though she lived with diabetes for most of her adulthood. For Nunez, the process of coming home commences with the discovery and ongoing invention of disabled community and queer community, and very specifically in New York, a community of disabled people of color. This is the same slide as I showed a minute ago. Yo Obsolete, this is the name of the performance that I will describe now, was Nunez's last performance in public before lockdown on the first Saturday in March of 2020. One can read into the very title, Yo Obsolete, a newly constructed and border crossing identity with a mix of Spanish yo, uh, I, and the English word obsolete, which would be actually in Spanish obsoleto or obsoleta. Um, but then yo also is an English interjection, yo. So he's giving you this border crossing title with the very performance name. Nunez here wears a pink hoodie painted with pop art, including Andy Warhol's bananas and red long johns, similar to underwear that has, had been worn by his violent Mormon father, a style of underwear that has become, Nunez notes, something of a sexual fetish object in the queer community. Nunez's performance have increasingly become, and here's this first point, process over product. Uh, and I think this is very appropriate for how uh, Ryerson has worked to make this an accessible event. His performances have increasingly become access experiments, positioning access as community and collective labor, but also as what the disability justice movement understands as collective joy and love. Yo obsolete, opens with the establishment of a tactile but ever-shifting border to the performance space, but also includes voiceover narration as the performance continues. Nunez often enlists the audience for the act of visual description for others, which can of course be quite unpredictable, but of course also generatively varied. In this performance shot, Nunez holds the toy truck by strings and spins, saying aloud, stop, daddy, stop, daddy. The please draw attention to the threat of violence, familial and otherwise against queer and trans children, against, again, those who go beyond the confines of the normal, as does the pink hoodie. Nunez explains, it's about the way that we see some colors are for boys and some colors are for girls, and some toys are for boys and some toys are for girls. I didn't care if I was a boy or if I was a girl. I just wanted to be myself. Another piece performed at the kitchen in New York City in 2019 was titled A Garden in the Shape of Dreams and gestured even more toward an imagined if not yet realized disability collectivity. This on the screen now is a multi-performer piece presented as a series of vignettes aimed both at evoking queer and disabled childhood memories and gesturing towards a future elsewhere and elsewhen. So Nunez here uses a, a green cloth to stage movement that connects the dancers who are, who are pictured here in an embrace at the moment. Nunez, in my mind, appears here as a sort of uh, 
queer and crip Peter Pan um, growing sideways, as the queer theorist Catherine Bond Stockton might put it in her study, The Queer Child. He embraces the other performers, children, two of whom melt here into his um, embrace, while another, not clearly seen in the, in the picture, is curled up in a fetal position at his feet. Nunez himself relates that this piece, quote, meditates on the isolation of the lives of children with disabilities and is meant to gesture towards creative play as a response to trauma and to isolation. He identifies that play as paracosm, which he explains is a persistent evocation of an imagined place inhabited by imagined people or beings. Disabled children, he continues, build these narratives in the secrecy of hiding places. During the pandemic, Nunez has held various positions, including artist in residence at the Center for Performance Research. I spoke to him about his work on lockdown, including a collaboration that will be published and available online for Performance Journal. I've been talking about both Chris, um, process and about collectivity, so my first two CRIP modalities. It's in reflecting directly on disability art on lockdown that these modalities come together with my third, Cripistemologies. Nunez spotlighted for me that we have been living through a period of history where non-disabled people are learning what most didn't have any clue about before, including what a particular kind of isolation feels like. And I suppose this is similar in Canada, non-disabled people, especially in the United States, have been very, very bad at learning these lessons. As my discussion of his 2019 performance suggests, disabled artists, however, were already turning isolation into gardens in the shape of dreams. For Nunez, the sharing of what he terms and others have termed cross-disability knowledge comes from a crip will to imagine and create always something beyond isolation. And what I love most about talking to Nunez about disability art on lockdown, however, was a crepistemological, and I would call it queer, will to bite the hand that feeds in order to feed more people in the process, both looking backward to where we have been and forward to where we might go. Let me give you an example of what I mean by biting the hand that feeds. I've long looked back to ACT UP as one quintessential moment in crip queer biting of the hand that feeds since the art collective for the AIDS activist group, Grand Fury, as they began to recognize, uh, to receive recognition directly from the art world, put out a simple image that you see here in, in white block letters on black with 42,000 dead art is not enough. Take collective action to end the AIDS crisis. The collective was put differently, literally generating art saying the collective we, that we must become need more than art, or at least we need more than art, more than the domesticated forms of art, often visible through museums, exhibitions, and grants. For Nunez, biting the hand that feeds has meant resisting in the collective interests of queers and of disabled people of color in particular that focus again on product. And I, and I actually found what I'm about to deal detail so sustaining even personally, since a lecture like this obviously is a product and Nunez's insights helped me to let go of that to a certain extent and focus more on the reasons for doing lectures like this, which are queer and crypt community rather than obsessing as I am want to do as readers of sex and disability know, uh, as I want to do over what that final product might look like. Generally, Nunez said, funding for dancers comes with the expectation that the final product, the final result is a performance product and he himself received his current assignment with that expectation. On lockdown, however, Nunez decided quite quickly that he didn't care about a product and that he was more interested in collecting and curating stories and experiences of those queer and disabled people who don't usually get funded. So he repeatedly turned towards that concept of disability justice to convey the evolution of his thinking. Disability justice, as I'm sure many listening know, is a concept developed in the uh, uh, developed by disabled and queer, black, indigenous people of color. The thinkers and artists involved in the movement include 
Patty Byrne, whose, whose name is associated with the draft of the principles of disability justice, Leroy Moore, and others, largely members of, on the screen now, the performance troupe Sins Invalid. Um, the performers on the screen right now are Nev Bianco and Antoine Hutter, Hunter. Disability justice insists on an intersectional approach that resists the mandates of neoliberal capitalism and that imagines queer crip people of color as leaders and authors of both the disability movement and disability culture. It has also attempted to think about a movement across borders, although arguably that has largely been the US and Canada. I'm quite interested for that reason in thinking about disability justice as a framework for approaching the vibrant work that's happening in Latin America. Hence, I'm thinking about the border crossing work today of Nunez. Nunez's contribution to disability justice while on residency and working for performance journals has been to look both backward and forward. So backward, he reflects on various crypt temporalities that are actually often actively invisibilized. I was working 20 hours a day, he tells me, just to pay the rent when I was undocumented. Many others were doing the same without books, without films, without workshops, without grants. That knowledge and motion has value, Nunez insists, and that knowledge is often increasingly, is often completely erased, even in disability community. Indeed, what I really love about Nunez looking backward to a 20 hour a day work day is how it requires us to expand or make multivalent our notions of crypt time. Crypt time has often been theorized almost exclusively, in fact, in relation to slowness. And I think um, that's really important. Something will happen later on a different timeline. One might not be able to be there in a certain place because of illness or fatigue. I don't want to discount any of that. And in fact, Nunez values that slowness, as I'll note momentarily. But his crepistemological insight, however, is also to link crypt time, especially for many disabled people of color and immigrants in a service economy, to the compulsory speed of capitalism and to a different type of exhaustion. He and many others worked those 20 hour days for survival, sometimes actively compounding disabilities and living lives not always legible as disabled. Reflecting back on that experience, he found himself wanting to value the disability knowledge that comes from that survival. And this comes for him with a very concrete commitment to changing the processes of funding, moving away from an emphasis on product to a focus on emotional experiences and experiential knowledge slow and fast that he feels has been, in his words, dismissed by white supremacy, including the white supremacy that disability justice has traced within the disability movement. There's a certain austerity logic built into the process of acquiring funding for art that invariably favors white people. Only the few will receive funding, the few who have the time, space, slowness to pursue individual grants, proposals, workshops, and so forth. Gathering other stories, curating other stories for Nunez entails, looking forward now, thinking beyond that austere logic. Nunez's play with, with and within a range of motions and his valuing of an expansive understanding of disabled temporalities suggests for me another crip mode, my fourth mode, crip pacing, that has been legible in his work and others on lockdown. Architects of a disability justice movement such as Lia Lakshmi Pipsna Samarazinya have theorized access as a form of quote, collective joy, collective joy and offering we can give to each other, unquote. I've already noted that Nunes's performance are often access experiments. They actively recruit participants for collective joy. Emma Shepard is one writer who has actively named the attention to varied temporalities and motions, crip pacing. And it, it's a good descriptor of Nunez's work on lockdown because as Shepard describes it, crip pacing is not about the capitalist compulsion to optimize production, but is rather a form of politicized self-care designed to quote, optimize joy. 
Shepard's own theorization of crip pacing, incidentally, is also delightfully queer as her work entails considering how disabled people in pain now might navigate BDSM collectively to maximize pleasure and joy. And BDSM, we might note, actively mixes, but quite consciously, sometimes fast, sometimes slow temporalities. For Nunez, the resistance of an able-bodied pacing that would mandate a quick motion from grant application to performance development, to final product, what we might ironically call Fitbit pacing or something like that, is crypt pacing in its will to generate collective joy, to encompass more experiences and stories into what we understand as disability art. Crypt pacing leads me to a final modality, my fifth, crip world making. And I'll only have time to note a few artists beyond Nunez in conclusion. So queer world making is the more famous mode, was first theorized by Michael Warner and Lauren Berlant and has since been widely used to describe queer practices that are quote, creative, performative, intimate, public, disruptive, utopian, and more. Crip world making is arguably more concrete since it often focuses on the literal reshaping of spaces with an aim towards imagining more bodies, minds, and behaviors in those spaces. Disability theorist Amy Hamre puts forward a concept of alter livability that helps to concretize crip world making. For Hamre, alter livability is, uh, she, uh, they write, um, a, a livability that is something she's, uh, they write, citing Anna Singh, a material discursive phenomenon that conjures visions of livability in spite of capitalist ruins and encourages expanding notions of lives worth living and pushing us to theorize how livable worlds materialize. And that for Hamra is design, their main area of study. And for me, it's imaginative crip queer performance today. So I'm, ad I'm adapting that concept of alter livability for our times, pandemic times, disability and disability art on lockdown. So I'll just give you a few more snapshots of what might be theorized as alter livability materialized through art to conclude. Um, um, Sins and Ballot has continued to generate art through the pandemic. I won't talk too much on that because we're running out of time. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a few snapshots so that we can get to the responses of a range of things that are happening globally on lockdown. In Mexico City, Teatro Ciego, um, this is sustaining the larger pivot of my work south, is a blind uh, dance and performance troupe that has gone online during COVID-19 taking their material experience of different sensory perceptions and dance to a new medium, and also offering, offering not just dance, but as shown here on the screen, comedy during a time of coronavirus. One of their main performances, uh, an ad for which is shown here, uh, has been one focused on the quotidian microaggressions and absurdities faced by blind people in a world constructed around the sighted. Los Ciegos Tambien Lloran, Blind People Also Cry, begins with commentary about the ridiculous questions directed at blind people, like, how do you know if you are outside or inside? The online performance ultimately aims to disorient the perception of sighted people whose own knowingness about where they are has been thrown into relief during the pandemic. As I mentioned, in the lockdown work that she is generating in Sweden, Bieland reaches for connections across time and space. Collateral Sounds, her current project in particular, traces a connection with Keith Haring, who died of complications from HIV AIDS, almost 30 years to the month from the global lockdown. Adapting Haring to our moment, Bieland uses his words uh, to describe what we are living through. This is Haring now. This, I feel, is the advantage of creating art at this point in time. When we realize that we are temporary, we are facing our self-destruction, we are realizing our fate and we must confront it. Art is the only sensible primal response to an outlook of possible destruction, obliteration. Bieland herself positions disability art at the, at the current moment as an attempt to uncover and resist such mechanisms of obliteration. 
Which brings me back to one more artist in Brazil, since I opened with Bolsonaro's obliteration of art during the crisis, uh, literally, again, imagining torture as an alternative to art. So just really quickly here, Esther Laponi um, is a Sao Paulo-based artist who has put forward online encounters between her body and the guitar, such as in the recent Selfish Camera, Born to be on Live. Um, to kind of summarize right, so that we can wrap up here, uh, Laponi is very interested in the ways that um, we live in this world saturated by selfies, but she takes the idea of the constant deployment of one's image and encrypts it, uh, exposes the ableism of it. And you see here her in an upside down portrait with her guitarist in a, in a green room elsewhere. In the Brazilian context, however, even as she reaches towards forms of ultra livability, Laponi has found it difficult, again, to place her work during lockdown, which, as I conclude, leaves that other valence of lockdown in the air. So I'll conclude there, again, noting a la Nunez, that this work on crip art on lockdown for me is very much not a final product, but a process of encountering modes of resistance against mechanisms of obliteration. These are just a few of the examples of many more artists offering in this moment of emergency other ways of perceiving and knowing collectivity, cripistemologies, crip pacing, and crip world making. These are essential workers deeply engaged in disability justice and in imagining and inventing the world that might come next. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, a uh, lot, that was amazing, uh, I'm so happy, uh, and it was, I, I was sort of rich and kind of vivid, vivid um, thought, and I'm so, lots and lots of questions that the audience has. Um, I want to now to move on, and we have two respondents who we have invited to uh, respond to uh, Robert's publications. Uh, there were many publications they responded to, so I'm actually really excited to hear what uh, our respondents had to say. Um, I will introduce both of them right now, um, and then it will go one, one after the other. The first respondent that we have with us is Sean Lee. Um, some of you might already know Sean. Um, and for those of you who don't, uh, Sean is an artist and curator exploring the notion of disability art as the last element of all the words that put horizon, his practice possesses the words that transform the possibilities of quick community building and accessible practices that desire a race disability can disrupt. Sean holds a BA in arts management and studio for the University of Toronto Starbucks and is currently a director of programming at Angle Art and Disability. He also is a member of the Ontario Art, Art Council's Death and Disability Advisory Group and the London Art Council's Visual Arts Media Arts Committee. Our second respondent, also someone many of you might know, is Jack Hop. Jack, uh, who goes by he, him, is an artistic, white passing, reconnecting Indigenous person who resides in Toronto and works in an outreach role with Angle Arts and Disability. Since moving to Canada in 2013, he has focused his passions on community youth work art services, performance, and personal practice in visual art and astrology. He has worked and or performed with organizations such as Urban Art Theater, Health Health, Ryerson University, British Council, and the Art Gallery of Ontario. So 
I will do the floor of the farm first and then Jack. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to also share my screen. <clears throat> So this is Disability on Lockdown, a response. Um, and as Ricky mentioned, um, my name is Sean. I use he or they pronouns. I'm an East Asian queer person and I'm someone who's visibly disabled. Uh, my back curves, my shoulders are uneven. And if you met me in real life, I'd be quite short of stature. Um, I have black hair. It's, um, it used to be a very cropped haircut and now it's gone down to my shoulders. I have uh, kind of light skin. Um, I'm wearing these steampunk glasses. They're green uh, with gold rims that float on the frames. I'm wearing a black kind of turtleneck. Um, I'm sitting cross-legged on a wooden dining chair uh, in, in my dining room. And in the background, um, I've got some art pieces. They're sort of like abstract um, art pieces by uh, disability artists. Um, and otherwise, it's a fairly nondescript dining room. Uh, I want to begin by, thank you, by, by thanking uh, Robert McClure for this opportunity to respond um, to that powerful keynote and the organizers at Ryerson, again, particularly Ricky, um, for this invitation. So while I recognize many of the folks here today, um, we've been chatting <laughs> uh, in the chat box. Um, for those who might not um, already uh, be familiar with me, uh, I'd like to introduce myself and my practice. Uh, I'm a disability artist and curator, and I'm also the director of programming at Tangled Art and Disability. Um, Tangled operates Canada's first disability art gallery dedicated to exhibiting uh, mad, deaf, and disabled artists, as well as exploring crypt curation and accessible practices. Although our gallery space is currently closed because of the pandemic, we, I wanted to tell, talk a little bit about uh, how it is uh, that we've quote unquote pivoted. Um, because we actually really initially resisted the instinct to simply pivot online with all of our exhibitions in part because we wanted to recognize that we are in a pandemic and as an organization made fully out of uh, disabled cultural workers, we wanted to make space to recognize this current situation that we're in. But we've since begun to uh, assemble and bring artists together again for things like online exhibitions, podcasts, and even working on a publication with the British Council called El Alto, a survey of disability arts practices across the Americas. For my piece on the panel, I wanted to focus on the world building potential of disability art and expand on the assertion that Robert makes that disability art on lockdown augments various crip world building practices, whereas Amy Hamrai terms alter livability. In particular, I wanna explore some of the accessible curatorial practices that attend to crypt technoscience and curation, or what uh, Hamrai and Kelly Fritch names uh, as historic contempor and contemporary practices of anti-assimilationist disability making and knowing. When disability artists and curators take on the mantle of crypt technoscience as a cultural practice to critique, alter, and the reinvention of our material discursive world through art, I think it becomes a political project that, as uh, my mentor Eliza Chandler notes, is motivated through the intention of allowing disability to shape culture, rather than using access as a way to include disabled people into normative practices. So I wanna reflect on the protocol I took when I first introduced myself. Um, you know, it included a self description. And in this description, I intentionally named my disability as very much a political action. Since the pandemic began, many disabled people have provided similar self descriptions when coming together on Zoom or other digital platforms. And I think we do this as a way of mitigating the normative assumptions of who is present and participating in these spaces. Self description being just one part of a host of 
cultural practices created and established by disabled people to hack the lack of accessibilities um, on these digital platforms. And it plays a distinct role in establishing new ways of configuring the social world we live in, one that desires disability differently. Practices like the self-description have helped me personally understand disability as something we participate in together, that in order to resist the narratives that disability is located solely within our bodies, we hold space for one another's body minds. And even though I might not require this particular access need, it's nevertheless a vital practice that makes one more stride towards what could be a crip utopia on the horizon. I once heard Eliza Chandler note that she was someone who embodied her disability with a mixture of pride and shame, and it resonated deeply with me. I've always embodied my visibly disabled, racialized and queer self with a mixture of pride and shame. Perhaps this is why I pursued an art career in the first place, as someone whose embodiment was a hyper visible gesture towards nonconformity. It often felt like I didn't have any other place to belong. And so I turned towards the arts as a way to explore the socio-political narratives of my life. But through disability arts and crypt curatorial practices, I've come to further complicate this desire to dwell with disability, a, de a, a desire that Eliza notes, which is antagonistic to the normative capitalist neoliberal desire to cure or kill disability. As Roberts so deftly highlighted, in the US and Brazil, austerity measures have made more precarious than ever the experiences of disabled people and particularly disabled artists. But here on the north part of Turtle Island or Canada, I think to dwell with disability as an artist is equally precarious. We're not exempt from systemic trenches and recent developments have made no attempts to hide the blatant ways disabled lives are undervalued. Since the pandemic, eugenic triage protocols and medical assistance in dying have insidiously targeted disabled people through those same neoliberal valences of neoliberal capitalism. Despite people with disabilities across Canada coming together for a tremendous show of solidarity through enactments like the disability filibuster, a three-day online filibuster filled with disabled people and artists protesting from our homes, a crip way of protesting, particularly suited for lockdown, I might add, um, and other activist work that was happening. The recent passage of Bill C-7 foregrounds the way disability is still only largely storied as a deficit in our mainstream. Bill C-7, for those of you who don't know, is a bill that would amend the vulnerable person's standard attached to Bill C-14, Canada's medical assistance in dying legislation. Uh, making it easier for disabled, mad, and deaf people, or um, our substitute decision makers, really, to access medically assisted death. But the conversation has largely not gained traction in mainstream spaces. Indeed, even mainstream coverage of Bill C-7 was largely minimal. As disability artist Alex Bulmer says, Canada does, does not support quality of life for disabled people yet it continues to support some notion of quality of dying. No country should focus on death until they have focused on life. Canada needs to put this energy towards quality of living. Otherwise, death will become the only alternative to a life unsupported, disregarded, and ultimately extinguished. And Alex says, may I propose S-A-I-L, supported assistance in living, which I think is a really really interesting gesture towards another way of understanding and desiring disability. So as Robert said, we're really in crypt times, <laughs> but as much as the phrase can present the hard times, bleak times, precarity and suffering, its position as a multivalent phrase excites me because it also gestures towards crypt utopia or what I might name the crypt horizon. I'd alluded to this horizon earlier and without naming it necessarily, but for me, the crip horizon is a promise of disability future, locating disability in an elsewhere and else then that runs counter to normative culture's assertion that disability has no future. I've borrowed this phrase from Jose Esteban Muno, 
who notes in Cruising Utopia, the then and there of queer futurity. Queerness is not yet here. Queerness is an idealty. Put another way, we are not yet queer, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. We have never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an idealty that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. The future is queerness's domain. And for crip futurity in its double bind of ableism and neoliberal biocapitalism, the concept of a crip horizon powerfully rejects the mainstream articulations of disability as a site with no future. And art plays a key role in establishing this moment of world building as it, not, as it is not only a gateway to possibilities, but can actually produce that reality. Disability art plays such a key role in not only producing new stories of disability, but producing those new realities to dwell with disability. And it's here that I wanna share three frameworks that have informed my curation and examples from artists who have particularly taken, particularly taken on the rewarding but challenging work of disability arts. And I start with um, a photo here um, of uh, the, the work Big Softy by Valentin Brown um, from the exhibition Body Farm at Tangled Art Gallery in 2019. Here there's um, what looks like a, a very kind of bright crocheted uh, heart made out of textiles floating on top of um, like tentacles and various uh, constructed kind of artworks uh, that reference kind of tendrils and different sort parts of uh, organic uh, body parts of sorts. Um, there's two hands kind of held out and holding this, this work. And I wanted to begin with this photo because Valentin for me uh, really embodied a very powerful juncture of queerness and cripness. And in particular, what Valentin's doing um, uh, highlights Amanda Kachia's notion of creative access. Uh, here, creative access allows us to uh, use accessibility with intention, not only as kind of a means to an end, as another alternative entry point into work, but as really a cultural aesthetic. And for me, this, this usage of access of, of ta tactile works um, and here in, in this piece, Valentin actually embedded uh, different uh, interesting kind of multi-sensorial ways of engaging the work. Uh, there were squeaky toys and different uh, uh, places would make noise when you touched it in a, a particular area. And uh, really it was meant to be a work that continued to evolve through the interaction of audience members. And so I think Valentin really took on this, this mantle of access as an important part of understanding uh, his practice as a queer and trans disabled artist. Uh, in the heart, uh, Valentin told me this beautiful story about how he participated in a queer residency. And at the end of the residency, all of the queer artists that he was um, in, in community with contributed a piece to go into that heart. To me, I think uh, I really want to see a similar uh, queer and crip kind of uh, moment happening in our, in, in our community to understand disability as something that we radically participate in together rather than those stories of deficit that have plagued um, our arts community. In the second slide, um, this is a photo of Tangled Art Gallery, um, the exhibition Hidden, uh, curated by Gloria Swain. And in it is a, a, a wall which holds just uh, some text and on it, it says holding space. And there's a large kind of wall of text um, underneath that. And this is a really powerful moment for me because it was a demonstration of disability justice, one of the other frameworks that I was referencing earlier. Um, one of the artists selected for this group exhibition wasn't able to participate um, after coming to the initial meetings and prep sessions. And so Gloria, as um, an aging black mad artist, was really trying to hold space um, for, 
for, for black artists with invisible disabilities in this exhibition. So rather than curate another artist, which perhaps there was time for, um, Gloria instead held space for this artist in a show of kind of resistance to the neoliberal capitalist and ableist systems, um, particularly present in the art world that exclude uh, many people who perhaps uh, aren't able to uh, participate in, in the sort of fast paced way the art world works. And uh, I think what Gloria really did was create access that disrupted those expectations of productivity and institutional expectations of what a quote unquote complete exhibition can look like. And instead created this powerful demonstration of disability justice in holding space for not only the artists who couldn't be there today, but all the artists who was, weren't able to participate um, in exhibition and in art spaces, whether through ableist or racist or uh, you know all, all the different ways that uh, the art world has created uh, a confluence of factors for excluding artists historically. And finally, I want to uh, think about a recent, um, a recent framework that I've heard about from Elwood Jimmy called Extensibility. And um, I'm using, uh, I'm showing uh, the artwork of Vanessa Dion Fletcher from the Own Your Cervix exhibition at Tangled uh, in 2017. And here Vanessa's work highlighted an important juncture of disability and indigeneity, inviting us to think about the ways our bodies are marked and defined by decentering colonial understandings of the agency we have over our own bodies. Um, in this piece here, there's a wall that's kind of been painted a menstrual red. Um, there are these hoops with um, uh, menstrual patterns that have been beaded on them. And there's this furniture that's been amplified with um, Vanessa's menstrual blood as well as porcupine quills. And going back to the phrase extensibility, Elwa Jimmy is really speaking to not only implementing access as a way of creating, you know, an alternative entry point into work, but that there's parallels between uh, the ways that decolonial work and access work has been done in trying in institutions that aren't ready for uh, these new politics of being. And so extensibility is about not only doing and knowing differently, but it's about being different. And I, I put up this example from Vanessa's exhibition because there was a very kind of interesting moment for us. Uh, in, in, the, in, in the middle, there's a large Victorian settee, which has, as I mentioned, uh, Vanessa's uh, menstrual blood and porcupine quilts. And so for folks to interact safely with this work was a really interesting um, moment for us to consider, does this work need a stanchion or some sort of plinth? But we ended up coming to the idea that perhaps instead what we need to do is ask, um, is, is really to extend an invitation to everyone who comes in to, uh, that, to let them know that this exists, that there's porcupine quills and we can help them to navigate this piece um, to the degree that they would like us to help them navigate it. And to me, that was a really radical moment because it was about access not being this sanitized checklist of um, safe ways of interacting with work, but it was instead about creating care collectively. And um, that was a really powerful moment for me in understanding the ways that extensibility, disability justice, and creative access can come together um, to create uh, something that might gesture towards that crip horizon. And as I mentioned, um, uh, access can be a really complex, uh, complicated uh, way of, of reconfiguring our worlds. And I curated an exhibition with Emily Cook called Access is Love. And love is complicated because we've really felt that this was an important um, cultural way of understanding disability to highlight. Disability is expansive, art is diverse, and we'll never reach a consensus on a singular disability art narrative, but I think therein lies the possibilities of the Crip Horizon. 
And that's where I'm going to stop and pass it back to Ricky. It's a lot of fun. It was amazing. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Jack, our second respondent. Just making sure I'm not mute. Okay. Hello. Um, my name is Jack Hawk, although I also use the name Winter to commemorate the blizzard of 95 in which two I was born. Maybe I have that to thank for the unique and chaotic circumstances in which my mind was shaped. I use he, him pronouns and live on this northern land as a Nancy boy, a trans deviant, and a white coated reconnecting indigenous person. I have black emo hair that is aged like a fine wine, side swept in medium length with a blonde highlight in the bangs. I'm wearing black thick rim glasses, a black high neck sweater, and a dark blue crystal necklace with white headphones. I'm also autistic, and so I want to add to my visual description that while talking, I may toy with my hair incessantly, uh, twitch in the eyes, gesture words with my hands before they come out of my mouth, and I may not look directly at the camera. Behind me, you see a staircase strung with lights and the ionic columns that make up my dimly lit underground home, which a colleague once referred to as looking like a Roman bath. To me, visual description has been a blessing in how it has allowed me agency and to provide my own context in the spaces I enter, where I might otherwise expect to be misunderstood upon first encounter. So while visual description is not access intended for me, I will say that I now find it irreplaceable and essential and hope you don't mind that mine is a bit long-winded. Like my colleague, Sean Lee, I am also a Tangled Arts and Disability acting as their outreach coordinator since 2019. I wanna thank Ricky for inviting me to be a part of this keynote to the access team and most of all to Robert McCure for the openness which invites these responses to his excellent work. I think coming into disability justice community for me is often an act of coming into language, finding the clarity to express what sits on the tip of my tongue. When considering that access deeply involves whether or not you also have access to discourse, such as Mikura argues for in Crip Theory and in this keynote, that it takes at least two people to make a Crip or a disabled person, to quote unquote fine words feels like an inherently political act. So please take my thanks as genuine. I'm no longer comfortable in a sterility of space, and I'm happy to defy it by saying I experienced high tides of emotion, thinking about the meaning and responsibility I bear in presenting even a short response to your brilliant keynote, and how little I would have believed just a year ago I would be welcome in a space like this. The privilege to make sense of something is one I encourage everyone to claim. I believe experiencing the things you discuss in your keynote and the discussions that we have as a community are worth hearing again and again, like prayers and rituals that remind us of the paradise we are seeking, which Sean coined and touched upon earlier, the Crip Horizon. Thanks for bringing me one step closer to that. Access to discourse has become holy to me and an intrinsic part of my sense of community, which has only been bolstered under lockdown. As Mia Mingus often discovers, uh, discusses in her work as a racialized queer stakeholder in disability justice theory, a disabled person lives in vulnerability partially because non-disabled people hold the cards of access. Disability art through the pandemic has revealed something to me, that cutting out the middleman is possible, and it becomes so by prioritizing the process, as McCure suggests, over product, and reconvening over the idea of what product means. As an example, since last summer, um, I've been helping coordinate an online exhibition with creative users called Deaf Interiors, co-facilitated by Sage Lavelle and Peter Uzo Anza. And though I wanna shy away from comparing deafness to disability in a way I'm not qualified to do, I wanted to bring in the fact that our premise for the entire product was not only shifted, but transformed by the collective of participating deaf artists simply because we gave them a discussion space, sorry, space without a hearing person present. That access to private community discourse blossomed euphoria and an ability to experiment with concepts that flipped the entire narrative of the project in which framed each of the artworks in deaf joy. 
In fact, I do very much believe the project became Deaf Joy rather than Deaf Interiors. The original exhibition was about the confines of a space disabled people live within, as past disabled interiors projects had been. Instead, the artist showed that through community, there was not a confine great enough to oppress their joy. I failed kindergarten because I could not tie my shoes. Joy is not a concept I ever put much stakes in until I had come into disability arts. Ableism to me has been the enforcement of isolation on disabled people, but also the enforcement of misery to leave a person feeling as though every moment is tinged with a hint of passive suicidality or self-harm or wrongness, where every action will have consequences and hurt to never be understood to never be held as your body or mind will never fit right in others' arms. Entangled 2019 exhibition, Ancestral Mindscapes. The artist Rick Miller presented film and photographic work showing the emotional depth, healing, and pain that came with revisiting the ghosts that haunted him in his disabled mad childhood. Uh, misery had confined him, but not just his misery, but the misery of his ancestors, of those disabled by society before him. The survival that McCure speaks about in Nunez's 20 hour workday in trying to stay home, a notion tinged with irony in the middle of a lockdown that urges the same of people, leaving many unsure where to go. But through process, healing was found in whatever complicated and unconventional form it needed to take. And with Rick's team of found family of artists, that help him guide his own way through that process. To me, this shows that the power of Crip community goes beyond just future creating, world building, but also enables past revision in the only way that's ethical. Um, and <laughs> I am autistic, so sometimes I use words to mean what I want them to mean. So what I mean to say is, for all the scholars and idealized history, of revered Western cultures and figures in the ideologies that would later expand to imperialism and exploitation of anything deemed not suitable enough to be white. Well, the smartest white men still came from knowledge pools that threw the disabled, their deviant off of cliffs, only their tragedies beholden to history. Like the queer and the racialized, too many of our histories lie on the bottom of lakes. We are like fossils being rediscovered as though our bodies do not currently live upon land. In that way, and as McCure discusses when touching on uh, various ways global austerity politics thrive in lockdown, I see COVID-19 as one symptom among others, which includes oil spills, unbreathable air, poisoned water. These are all symptoms of suffering, environmental racism, and climate crisis. After all, in the words of indigenous director and playwright Tara Moses, colonialism is a structure, not an event, uh, a structure inseparable from our bodies. The stillness and disability arts that McCure mentions, to me, this feels like a necessary pause to consider next steps. In Natalie Diaz's book, Postcolonial Love Poem, she writes, in Mojave thinking, body and land are the same. The words are separated only by letters. Imat for body and amat for land. In conversation, we often use a shortened form for each, uh, mat, just by itself. Unless you know the context of a conversation, you might not know if we are speaking about our body or our land. You might not know which has been injured, which is remembering, which is alive, which was dreamed, which needs care, and which has vanished. Again, to me, COVID-19 is distinctly a symptom of an illness deep set in our earth called colonialism. And disability, as McCure suggests, will continue to expand and transform due to this. But it's also this that makes me feel comfortable li living within disability justice as someone historically displaced by colonialism. Though there is work to do and white supremacy to dismantle even within the ideology of what disability is, to me, the very concept of crypt times sees it all as moving parts of a larger responsibility to one another in our world, that we are each other's harvest and to curate a livable world, one that does not depend on product or function, but experience joy and flourishing. And in the blur of what next steps could entail in thinking of examples such as how the NHS in the UK 
has used the pandemic as a distraction to run trans healthcare dry enough to exile their trans citizens, um, to prevent people an opportunity to live. I think of how Cooper Lee Bombier writes in Pass With Care as a part of a literary narrative written in eight folds to represent the trans body's path. This trans body trains the doctor to see it as a patient and its needs as deserving of care, much in the same way wolves trained humans to see them as dogs. I read this through a disability lens as well and consider how disability arts during lockdown has proposed a revision of performance and that every day that I exist in an ableist world, I am performing a version of myself to survive. The marginalized person under capitalism lives in segmentations, the customer service smile versus the lifeless gaze they share with the ceiling, the pleasant conversation with the doctor who forces you to stand and walk on disabled legs, the sex we have with a lover who doesn't know how to touch our deviant bodies. But performance in lockdown is disconnected. Expectations have changed. To me, there is a pause of consideration allowed by the intention of a screen. And I think this pause can be a creative space. Although not everyone has equal access to this pause, I nonetheless use it to reconsider what I want my drag to be. What disabled body will walk on stage? Instead of using our performance as survival, can we thrive in it as play, as McCure implies when thinking of Nunez's work? If anything, that's what I've seen in disability arts on lockdown a refusal to not have fun, a refusal to not toy with the structures we unwillingly exist in. And so, you know, when discussing the work of Smokey Sumak, a two-spirit poet who focuses on coming home to indigeneity and queer love narratives, the Algonquin feminist scholar Jen Cole writes, from Sumak, I am learning and remembering that medicine tears soften this hard and angry world, that we are all necessary by way of our creation that we should visit one another, that the moon looks on us without judgment, that it is always good to make an offering, that falling in and out of love is turbulent and wonderful, and that we can be honest with ourselves and one another. And so on that note, and to close on something of a tangent, I wanna share a few thoughts about a practice of death work, which I had after reading uh, both McHugh's keynote and Sean's response. I consider myself a death worker in the sense that I do not move a muscle without considering death. Death almost comes easy to disabled people. As Sean touched on when discussing Bill C-7, so many of us have been taught to expect it every day of our lives. We live in a contemporary living process of genocide that is fueled by legislation like C-7. He said all that I would say about quality of life versus quality of death. And so I will use Sean's words um, and the foundation that I wholeheartedly agree with him to move forward to my final point. Um, you know, we grew up knowing there's no one looking out for us but one another, and especially being queer and or racialized disabled people. There's that added notion that there's also no families, no histories, no friends to look after us either. And that's the fundamental idea of why communities around political identity are created. So I can't help but consider as a personal inquiry and as a person disabled by the suicidality I spoke about before, if I have somewhere to go home to, does my art? And then if I move in crypt time slower than my life can manage, will my work always have a place to go home to, even in death, if that's how long it takes me to create what I mean to create? And can the works of disabled artists be a living process after we cease to live bolstered by community? We constantly redefine the meaning and joy of what it means to be alive. Can we also transcend what it means to die? Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Zach. That was amazing. And this is, uh, it was an amazing, amazing response. And I also want to extend my answer to Sean again for for his response. Um, uh, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Zach and Sean to um, come back uh, to the screen so that we can have a more, hopefully, robust conversation. Um, but before we start the, the discussion, uh, 
uh, on the TV. I want to ask Robert if he had any responses in the respondents. Um, and, and the respondents provided such rich um, remarks. And I'm sure there's a lot that can be responded to, but I want to kind of hear if you had any thoughts, any initial thoughts before we kind of open up the floor for a uh, conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Ricky. And Thank you, Sean and Jack, for those amazing responses. Uh, so rich in so many ways. And I learned a lot and took some notes as you were going. I don't want to respond at length because I want people to be able to join us in, in conversation. But I do really want to first appreciate um, this idea of dwelling in disability in Canada. So. I mean, I'm obviously writing from a position south of you and also writing to the south as I work more on Latin America lately. But as readers of sex and disability know, um, as I have a piece in there with Nicole Markadic from the University of Windsor, um, we in the US tend to romanticize Canada. Um, uh, there was a point where I was uh, at a job interview in, in Canada and learning about how you all have equity studies there. And I was like, oh, you know, no equity for us, please. We're Americans. Um, and that romanticization of Canada really covers over the fact that there are so many ongoing problems with austerity, with um, disability, uh, the disability movement in general. So I really appreciate the ways in which you took the things that I said and made them specific to Canada. And I love learning about this disability filibuster. So we're talking in the US because the filibuster is actually really about privileging um, minority white voices in the United States. The filibuster in the US government allows uh, for small white states to dominate conversation in government. So the slogan in the US is abolish the filibuster. And I love the ways in which you're kind of turning that on the head in Canada and saying, no, 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 abolish the filibuster, just transfer it to other people who actually have things to say and who aren't being heard. So thank you for that really beautifully Canadian uh, extension of the things that I, that I was saying. I also love the ways in which both of you really connected everything we're talking about sort of implicitly to climate crisis. Um, I, uh, one of the slides that I didn't have time to really talk very long about was um, Sins Invalid, um, a performance by Sins Invalid during lockdown that was actually addressing the ways in which climate crisis is a disability issue. Um, so learning about the holding space uh, um, concept and, and artistic practice uh, really, brought back to me Bruno Latour's idea, that's Latour is L-A-T-O-U-R, uh, Bruno Latour's idea of landing somewhere, which he means specifically to, to be decolonial, not landing somewhere to take it, not landing somewhere to appropriate it, but recognizing that we are situated in a location that needs to be something that we understand in a really, uh, textured way. And I feel like holding space is doing that too, whether it's explicitly meant to be eco theory, it's also this kind of double statement, like holding space could be taking space from someone else, but it also seems to be holding space for all of us in a way that is about collective care and about recognizing what that space has meant and, and could mean. And so both talks for me kind of had that kind of eco uh, theory, eco activism, background to them, which I really appreciated. I love Jack's also idea that visual description wasn't intended for me, but I love it. And I get all these unexpected things out of it. It's a long standing crypt practice of sort of saying that an access, uh, that, that access is unexpected, provide access in as universal a way as possible and unexpected things are going to happen from that. So I really love that and the ways in which it allows for, um, of valuing and extending and learning from autistic ways of knowing. So 
Um, I also love that refusal that is queer and crip to not have fun. Uh, and, it, you know, I think through a pandemic, through anxiety, through depression, through obsession, it's like, how can we have fun? It's not supposed to be fun. Uh, but, you know, queer and crip traditions have basically taught us like, no, it, you know, we're going to make it fun despite all of this shit. And we're going to imagine this crip horizon that is something better. So thank you to both of you for those beautiful responses. Now, I think we um, explain the help us with the questions. Um, so, I, um, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Tally. I use they and she, and I work at the School of Disability Studies and Access Support. Um, I'm a queer, white, fat person who uses they, them, and she, her pronouns. Uh, and I would love to direct you to the Q&A um, button that's on your Zoom bar. So um, there are many ways for you to ask questions. Uh, for folks that it's an access barrier to type, you can raise your hand and then I can unmute you so that you can ask your question. You can also do that if you just prefer to ask your question that way. Um, you can use the Q&A function, which you can type your question into and then um, I'll read it out loud to the panelists. You can also enter your question or your discussion point into the chat and I'll make note of it and read it there. Um, so we actually already have our first question from Sri uh, who asks, Robert, I'm curious to hear how you consider your work and Crip nationalism as having parallels to Jasbir Pouar's work around homo nationalism. Um, it is directly indebted to Jasper Poor's work. So um, the first time that I wrote a piece that dealt with the concept of crypt nationalism was uh, an article titled Disability Nationalism in Crypt Times. It was in the Journal for Literary and Cultural Disability Studies. And if someone wants to paste a, a link to that in the chat, that'd be great. Um, it basically looked at, you can, if, if one knows Jasbir Puar's work, uh, and that's P-U-A-R, uh, if you know Jasbir Puar's work, um, queer times as a phrase becomes kind of doubled for Puar. So on the one hand, uh, Puar is very concerned about the ways in which excessive bodies, what she terms the terrorist body, are made perverse, excessive, and queer at a time when queer people in other senses are being increasingly incorporated into state and market. So queer times for her are both good and bad in that sense of um, generating even more abject queerer figures at the same time that some queer figures are incorporated. So I have used the concept of crip nationalism to do that in a disability context where obviously, um, well, one of the projects that I'm working on right now is very interested in, uh, these are US figures, but disabled figures such as Greg Abbott, who is the, um, governor of Texas and wheelchair user Madison Cawthorn, who is kind of a star of the far right uh, representative from North Carolina and a the youngest member of the US Congress right now. These are out and proud disabled people, but to focus on their disability, which they do quite openly, is to obscure the ways in which their policies uh, are detrimental to the vast majority of disabled people and impaired bodies and minds and so forth. So um, Greg Abbott as governor of Texas, it doesn't matter that he is this out and proud disabled person if his administration is suggesting that old people should be sacrificed for the good of the economy in the COVID epidemic. It doesn't matter if he is out and proud as a disabled person if 
um, children are in cages at the Texas-Mexican border. So crip nationalism kind of gets at the ways in which certain disabled figures can be incorporated and celebrated at the expense of, of others. So in Sex and Disability, I, I wrote about that from a very personal story about potentially moving to Canada when um, the my partner at the time was actually blocked from potentially entering because he had multiple sclerosis. And it was at the time uh, a possibility that he would be an excess burden, I forget what the Canadian language was, to Canadian health and social services, and potentially denied um, you know, the treatment that he needs to live as a person with multiple sclerosis. And so we didn't go to Canada. We didn't cross the border into that romanticized happy place where supposedly everything is wonderful. Um, and so I wrote about that very personal experience in the context of how crypt nationalism nonetheless celebrates, say, uh, in a film like Murderball, um, uh, disabled athletes crossing borders all the time and, and being, again, sort of out and proud and sexual and uh, all that. Um, so I, I wanted to use crypt nationalism as a way of getting at the very complicated neoliberal moment that we are in. And I should say, for those of you who have looked at sex and disability, that piece on the US-Canadian border was co-written with uh, Nicole Markadich, which is M-A-R-K-O-T-I-C. OK, I'm going to uh, let Justin Levesque talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. This, uh, was uh, really so wonderful. Uh, thank you uh, for all of the talks. Um, so uh, kind of jumping off of what Sean um, was mentioning in terms of like this notion of like disability futures um, or crit futures and sort of what that looks like sort of um, start, started to make me think a little bit about like what are potentially like uh, potential alternative crip or disabled realities, um, thinking a little bit about like augmented reality, or extended reality and or virtual reality um, and how um, that's a potential space um, for folks who are experiencing this kind, this particular, I guess, sort of corporeal reality um, to explore and exist in. Um, and actually specifically just thinking about um, the shape arts exhibition that just occurred, um, I think just launched a couple of days ago. Um, so uh, that was actually just super inspiring to see, but also kind of curious to almost uh, maybe make a North American or South American take on that potentially, or just in general, um, how do you see, especially in this period of lockdown, you know, those um, technologies becoming important as a way of expression in disability art? I think, Sean, you are, you are being hailed here. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's, it's really interesting because I think a lot of the discourse right now has been around some of the access that is now available to uh, to disability community, folks who have been advocating for, for some of these uh, different practices for a long time. Things like, you know, working from home, things like virtual meetings are now possible. And I was, I was recently in a, a a conversation with Carmen Papalia and Anita Say Chen, where we talked about the possibilities of, um, you know, the the digital digital space as a gathering site, and Anita brought up a really interesting kind of way that these these uh, virtual gatherings have been co opted by a neoliberal politic, you know, what, what she calls the quant, the fetish, fetishization of the quant and uh, really this desire to justify practices through this ability to now reach broader and larger audiences than ever. And so I'm always a little bit hesitant to kind of place digital 
uh, ways of gathering in these really um, kind of ov overly romanticized ways. But I do think that there are really interesting uh, models of uh, collectivity that exist right now in terms of how we come together in online spaces, you know, with, uh, for instance, um, Kevin Gotkin's uh, remote access parties. I think those are beautiful ways in which people hack and crip um, the modalities of, of Zoom, for instance, through uh, crypt techno science. And so I'm really interested in the ways that VR and, and AR can actually be a kind of gathering place or critical mass for uh, you know new practices to exist because AR and VR is still I think a very unexplored place. So for for us you know at Tangled we we really are interested in using these technologies and not only to to platform disabled artists but hopefully to establish some of those practices early on so that we can come into those spaces with uh, these different practices uh, without, uh, with, with disabled people in mind. Because right now, you know, you look at Silicon Valley and everything is designed with white, able-bodied, um, you know, designers as the default, as the kind of audience base. And so I think for us, we really want disabled folks and to build capacity for disabled folks to create and participate in this technology so, so that we shape the culture of it. Um, and we can we can gesture towards kind of what Taeyun Choi would call um, non-binary futures, you know, and I'm really interested in that site of, of non-binary futures, not just, you know, uh, what is what is on and off what is able-bodied what is disabled but really the the liminal spoon the liminal spaces uh, in between uh i don't think it answers that question <laughs> very concretely because i think vr and ar are still such a site of possibilities um but that's sort of what came to my mind as we were talking about this that's great thank you sean uh, so we have a couple questions here still left. Hopefully we can get to them. Um, but that's probably, I'm going to say we probably won't be able to answer any more questions than we have in the Q&A right now. Uh, so the first one is uh, curious how you all have found ways of caring for yourselves, finding comfort and inspiration during the pandemic. Thank you. And sorry, that was from Cody. It's been hard. And I think that the first thing we have to acknowledge is that it's not easy. Um, I will be very curious what Jack and Sean might have to say about this. Um, and I think we have been talking about lots of inventive ways that people have tried to care for each other. I think my, my own experience, uh, my relationship is transnational and so, I went to Colombia for 10 days in um, March of 2020 and ended up being there for six months. And so lockdown was like literally quite an intense lockdown for me. Um, I was fine, but it was lockdown with one person uh, in a much more extensive um, lockdown than what was happening in the U.S. And I was actually happy for that. Um, I was looking back with horror at what was going on in the U.S. that led to actually astronomical numbers of uh, infections in the United States. Um, you know, I think like lots of people, I taught myself to expand my network of people that I check in with regularly and, um, you know, just checked in on them for no particular reason. I also had the intense luxury of moving into sabbatical when I was going on to lockdown. And so I trained myself to sort of say, even when Ricky's like, you want to come talk at, at Ryerson? I was in a mode of like, okay, nothing has to happen today. And I, that was a huge luxury that I could get up and say that, but it was a way of taking care of myself, uh, especially not knowing when 
I ended up taking a humanitarian flight back to the United States in August, but I, for months, I didn't know when I was coming back. And so part of self-care was just like, okay, nothing needs to happen today. Uh, and I'm glad that I was able to be in that space, but Jack, Sean, what about you? I, for some reason, what came to mind is um, another disabled friend, uh, an artist and curator recently out of nowhere sent me a package um, and I opened it and inside it was actually um, a sourdough starter. <laughs> and um, the next day I, I got this big invitation. Um, you know, my friend had actually sent it to folks all around. They're based in, um, in, in New York um, and like they put together this really incredible gathering for disabled folks to, to kind of ferment together and just uh, there were access notes and it was, it was really about just finding a way for folks to connect in this sort of time of isolation. And so to me, I think that was really radical. It was like, if we can't get together in a kitchen, I'm gonna send you parts of my sourdough starter so that we can all participate in this together. And that was just like, that was care that to, to me, that was, that was access is love and um, yeah, sourdough starter, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. And uh, for me, I'm, I mean, I'm sure I find this as complicated a question as uh, you both do. And maybe this harks back a little bit to the previous question of, uh, you know, I think being autistic, I lived most of my adolescence in digital worlds. And then as I got older, um, I had to learn to exist in the physical world. And also when I moved to Toronto and could create safe bubbles for me to exist in the world um, safely, and then the pandemic happened, it's almost like I went back home into the digital. Uh, and in a way that kind of has been my self care in like harping back to the nostalgia of what cared for me as a child. And also maybe as an autistic person, I always need to be dabbling in some form of escapism in order to lift the burden of oversensitivity to the world I'm living in. Um, especially the overwhelming grief of the past two years. Um, and I think it's, it's actually almost been nice because I think once I everything slowed down in a way that was more custom for me and, you know, work slowed down and connections slowed down, I realized, oh God, I, <laughs> I don't take care of myself. <laughs> and then the pandemic kind of heightened that. And so... I almost just think my self-care has been um, trying to find forms of self-care that aren't temporary. My hope is to leave the pandemic uh, a little bit more uh, secure in my own daily rituals to take care of myself. I guess the pandemic, my self-care has been using it as a space of experimentation to figure out what is actually good for my body and my mind and what boundaries do I want to set with people moving forward. I guess I haven't really rested that much, <laughs> um, but it's something I, I, that feels like throughout all the grief, at least I made something worthwhile. And for me, finding some worthwhile meaning of it was the self-care. I also um, play a lot of Fortnite, if that helps. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the end of my thought. <laughs> So unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to get to the next questions that we have, and they are really wonderful. And um, so thank you for submitting them. Uh, and we, we'll save this chat for later. Uh, okay, uh, Ricky, I'll hand it back over to you. Um, I just want to thank um, our speakers, especially Robert, Sean, and Jack uh, for a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, set of uh, conversations. Like it, it's been really, really illuminating on so many different levels. Um, 
and it's also the desire to see it kind of in about what, what it is, is uh, in, in about what life is going to look like after the so-called lockdown and after the pandemic, especially now that conversations of the like vaccine is now, vaccines are becoming more and more part of um, everyday life. And so what, what kinds of futures we might be able to imagine yeah, I, I believe it's yet to be um, decided and it um, So I just want to thank our speakers. I want to thank everyone at Liasen School of Disability Studies, uh, uh, I want to thank Angie and DL and Mel for their support. And I also just want um, everyone who showed up um, Tonight for this conversation. Um, the chat discussions were as much a part of the evening as the lectures. So thanks a lot and have a nice evening. Bye.